Hello and thanks for tuning in to the show that goes around the continent to bring you stories near and far. I'm Jocker Rogers at Channel's Television here in Lagos and I'm joined by Vincent McCory from The Voice of America in Washington, D.C. Thanks, I'm Vincent McCory at The Voice of America. Happy to be with you again for another edition of Africa 54. Let's start off with the latest from Nigeria. Jocker Rogers in Lagos brings you that story. The federal government has approved new radiotherapy and nuclear medicine facilities for six federal teaching hospitals in the country. As part of steps to address cancer care and treatment, the permanent secretary of the Federal Ministry of Health, Kacholom Daju, stated this at an event to mark the World Cancer Day in Abuja. Our correspondent, Victoria Longjun, reports. It's a gathering of government representatives, policy makers, health practitioners and implementing partners to discuss challenges and gaps and explore sustainable solutions focused on improving care for cancer patients in Nigeria. The theme for this year is Close the Care Gaps. In the bid to improve cancer treatment in the country, the government established the National Institute for Cancer Research and Treatment, which officially began operations last year. This institute's role is pivotal in the nation's cancer control strategy. We have made significant progress in raising awareness about the causes, symptoms and prevention of cancer in Nigeria by empowering individuals with knowledge we aim to reduce the incidence of late stage cancer diagnosis and improve early detection rates across Nigeria. The federal government reiterates its determination to see better care for cancer patients and a reduction in prevalence. The Federal Ministry of Health will continue to play its vital role in the oversight of the policy environment. We will continue to work closely with all stakeholders, including international development partners, civil society organizations and the private sector to ensure the effective implementation of the National Cancer Control Plan 2023 to 2027 across all its pillars. A panel discussion then followed, where participants discussed cancer registration, data collection and strategies to enhance capacity and upgrade of the National Cancer Registry, amongst other issues. We definitely know that there is no way we can properly plan a cancer program without data. So it's a good thing that NICRAT is working in that direction. But the thing is that we can't work in isolation. That has been one major problem in the country. So there's been a lot of comments by government representatives and other stakeholders here today on the need for more collaboration. But emphasis has also been placed on prevention, as this is an important factor considering the financial and psychological impact of cancer. Now, it is hoped that soon enough, through concerted efforts by policymakers, cancer will no longer be a life threat, but a disease that can be managed. From the nation's capital, Victoria Longchen for Channels Television News. Joining us to discuss cancer care and treatment in Nigeria, consultant, radiation and clinical oncologist Luth, Dr. Eben Adepito, joins us on the program. A warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Right, he joins us from Kenya today. Uh, so let's start from the beginning. Uh, and a lot of issues that uh, people grapple with, that those who eventually uh, have cancer, is, you know, detection. A lot of people, by the time they're diagnosed with cancer, it's almost, you know, too little too late. They're in the stages three or four or, you know, the the stages that are considered as, you know, nothing can be done anymore and they only can just, you know, go through special care. So how early can cancer be detected? Okay, so we're talking about cancer prevention. Uh, I'd rather start, I'd rather I take the discussion from the, from the, the prevention arm of it. Okay, so cancer can be prevented. About 30 to 50% of cancers are preventable. Now, when we talk about preventable cancers, it means that cancers that are uh, associated with particular risk factors that leverage on human behavior. Smoking, alcohol consumptions, 
uh, are those risk factors that are associated with human behavior that are linked to a lot of cancers. So screening basically is the tool and it's the way with which you can detect cancer in its pre-invasive stage or in its earliest forms. And right, there are concerns in something that, you know, I read up lately that uh, there are a lot more, you know, cancer cases being reported in Nigeria and, you know, the, the cases are increasing by the day. Uh, where are we in this, in the country? Um, should we be really concerned that, you know, cancer cases are really, um, you know, turning up now both in men and women? Yeah, uh, cancer uh, care and cancer prevalence is akin to what we call an, a pandemic now. We look at it because, and I must say that this mirrors other countries of the world. Uh, lifestyles changing, uh, feeding habits changing. We have more sedentary forms of living now. Uh, well, one of the implications of having that uh, came with COVID is the fact that a lot of people work from home. Right. And, you know, we, we did talk about, you know, people, you, you spoke about um, the COVID and people working from home. So a lot of people are not, don't know that, you know, they have some of these things because they, they don't go out a lot. So a lot of cases, you know, have been attributed to late diagnosis uh, and it has been the bane of cancer treatment in Nigeria. But is this due to patients' ignorance or uh, what some people say uh, is the fear of, you know, the cost implications. Uh, some hospitals have been said to, you know, have some toxic pricing systems for cancer, knowing that it's a health uh, um, menace that needs to be treated. And so people will pay no matter what because they want to save their lives. Uh, well, I, I think it's an interplay of both factors that you mentioned. There is a high level and high degree of ignorance in our community. And um, uh, a lot of cancer is still being attributed to, quote and unquote, spiritual causes. So when this disease happens, a lot of people run to uh, spiritual leaders, the clerics, the imams and the pastors, and they take time to pray. I don't have any problem with that. But you should know that um, at the point when the prayers have gone to a point and the disease is not abating, you should visit the hospital. The other issue you mentioned is a really big issue. The financing of, of cancer, uh, it's, it's a big problem. And a lot of people would just rather retire home and just stay home uh, to a point where the disease no can no longer respond you know to active treatment and um, we just have to resort to end of life care or palliative care you know in taking care of them right and i must throw this in you know as i close with you uh, there are those who believe that, you know, there, there are some unorthodox ways that you can actually treat cancer. I'm not talking about spiritual now. I'm talking about, you know, um, natural ways. Uh, some people have said uh, um, um, things like soursop and some other vegetable, you know, can actually take care of cancer. I know that here we're talking about, you know, Western medication as well. So is, is that a school of thought that is being, um, how would I put it, explored? You know, is there any, um, has there been any manifestation that, you know, such vegetables or fruits can actually be used to treat and uh, maybe cure cancer? Some swear by it. Well, um, people have different experiences and, you know, the narratives are different. Uh, rather than you take sars off and these vegetables when you are in optimum health. It may have a way of temporizing the disease, you know, but it's, it's, um, it's keeping the disease for, for, for another day. It's like um, when you have a wildfire, instead of you stopping that wildfire, you, you're trying to, using kids' gloves to manage it. And at a point in time, it's going to get to a point where you will not be able to manage that anymore. Now, I've seen people, I've seen patients talk about these experiences, but I'm yet to see one who comes out in the open, either the practitioner or the patients who say that, yes, we used ourself or we used its sleeve or we used, uh, uh, we used all of that vegetables and has been able right. to make the patient cancer-free. I must also mention that 
cancer stories are not as gory as people present them. Uh, we have people who survive cancer five years, 10 years, 15 years, and who are doing very well. But right. the stories that go to the airways and go and that are filtered around are those who come at a late stage, a stage three, stage four. I must say that 85 to 90 percent of our cases, our patients present at this late stage. And at this late stage, there's nothing any yeah. doctor can do to cure. Right. We can only palliatively manage such cases. Thank you. Uh, consultant, radiation and clinical oncologist, Dr. Eben Adepiton, thank you for your time today. Thank you very much for having me. Catholic bishops in Malawi have joined other African bishops defying the recent Vatican declaration allowing the blessing of same-sex unions. Chimwemwe Padata has more from the capital Lilongwe. Malawi is a majority Christian country dominated by Roman Catholics who make up about 20% of the Christian community according to a 2018 population census. Many Catholics, including Catholic Church leadership, say they are struggling to follow through with their mid-December announcement by the Vatican permitting priests to bless same-sex unions. We have moral values to protect and cultural values as well, which have to go in tandem with the teaching of the church. So it's not being inflexible or not being uh, rigid. It is pastor in nature. And so it can be taken on board or not be taken on board. So we have chosen not to take it wholesomely that uh, we have to bless people's same-sex union. My stand is a big no to, to same-sex marriages. They're saying two things at once. Teaching says um, marriage between a male and female. Several other Catholic churches in Africa, including those in Nigeria and Kenya, have also rejected the Vatican declaration. But despite that, some in the LGBTQI community who asked to remain anonymous due to security fears are hopeful and say they are eagerly waiting for the blessings. In a country like Malawi, I know it's really going to take uh, some time. If given a chance, I will go for it. But so much to say that I, I, I really don't see that happening uh, the soonest uh, in, in African countries. Changing minds may not be easy. In July 2023, religious leaders led street protests against homosexuality, which currently is a criminal offense within a maximum sentence of 14 years imprisonment. Pope Francis, in the days after the declaration, acknowledged the controversy and encouraged people to embrace change. Chimwewe Barata, VOA News, Lilongwe, Malawi. The upcoming elections in South Sudan comes into focus as the United Nations holds interactive sessions in Juba to familiarize the people on the election progress. Reconstituted Joint Monetary and Evaluation Commission is the body responsible for monitoring and overseeing implementation of the 2018 peace deal, which brought an end to years of civil war. South Sudan is heading towards its first elections at the end of this year, and according to the UN mission in the country, there is a growing recognition that to build a better, more peaceful future, citizens need to head to polling stations in December 2024. This is a good chance for newly uh, appointed commissioners to be given knowledge about election preparations and to learn more about the procedures which are going to be implemented right now. Mr. Chol is candid that time is of the essence but believes that if collective will is harnessed and citizens are fully included, South Sudan can hold free, fair and credible elections. For Darren Nance, the UN Peacekeeping Mission's Principal Electoral Affairs Officer, leading the UN's Integrated Electoral Assistance Team is a focused three-day exchange with key interlocutors and is very aware of the magnitude of the task ahead. So the main focus um, uh, is to discuss the multitude of challenges uh, to prepare for an election uh, in, in 10 months' time. Elsewhere, upcoming elections and the permanent constitution dominated discussions at a monthly meeting of the Reconstituted Joint Monitoring and Evaluation Commission, the body responsible for monitoring and overseeing the implementation of the 2018 peace deal in South Sudan which brought an end to years of civil war. RJMX therefore urges the Article and partners support the INCRC in order, to be, in order for it to conduct much needed civil education and public consultations for the permanent constitution, which is also a critical requirement for the conduct of elections 
as per the agreement. Nicholas Hasem, the top United Nations official in the country, agreed and urged all stakeholders to pick up the pace in terms of electoral preparedness. Recent views from some civil society groups and academics highlight an appetite for the elections. However, there are legitimate concerns about the preparedness of key institutions, particularly the state security apparatus. It's also evident that the electoral and constitution making commissions lack the resources, although we've heard today this may be addressed, including office space and equipment to move at the pace needed to achieve the desired readiness across the country. The head of the UN peacekeeping mission acknowledges the swearing in of key commissions that enable a series of activities and the framework for election management, preparation of priority tasks and budgets to operationalize the plans, including the commencement of the registration of political parties by the political parties council and earmark key areas where progress must be tangibly demonstrated. Kenya is struggling to repay a massive debt owed to China for the construction of the standard gauge railroad that links the Kenyan cities of Mombasa and the capital Nairobi. But President William Ruto is asking for an additional billion dollar loan from China to complete some of the other stalled development projects in the country. Kennedy Wandera has more from Nairobi. We must admit, honorable members, that as a country, we had been living large and way beyond our means. President William Ruto, who has been a vocal critic of former President Uhuru Kenyatta's policy of borrowing money from China, appears to have changed his position as he looks for money to finance Kenya's development projects. Earlier this month, Ruto's government announced it will ask the Chinese government to give it more time to pay off existing loans and for an additional $1 billion loan. The new loan will help Kenya complete toll road construction projects, pay contractors who abandoned work of unpaid bills, and invest in ongoing infrastructure projects such as extending the country's standard gauge railway northwest to Malaba at the border with Uganda. It is a big flip-flop from two months ago when Ruto told the country he planned to stop borrowing money. We were in a very bad position. We had a lot of debt and we didn't have a plan on how to solve that problem. I would like to tell you that we have stabilized the economy of the Republic of Kenya. We have made sure that we won't be borrowing loans anymore. Stabilized the economy of the Republic of Kenya. China is Kenya's second largest lender after the World Bank. During Kenyatta's presidency, Kenya took out 8 billion US dollars in Chinese backed loans to finance the initial construction of the 480 kilometer standard gauge railway from the port city of Mombasa to the nation's capital Nairobi and the construction of a major Kenya highway. During Kenyatta's tenure in power, his administration also spent about 8 billion US dollars to repair and build 10,000 new kilometers of highway across the country to pay back what the country owes and the new loans he is asking for, Ruto's government announced plans to expand employment and raise taxes as two of the ways to pay back the loans. But economic experts like Charles Carissa are worried that it's not going to work and believe it is financially dangerous. As a developed nation, it's a, it's a, it's a bad situation we're in right now because if you borrow more, then it means you know, we have less to, 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 uh, to, 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 to take care of our needs. One of the things that I will argue this government to do is to relook at the issue of taxation because uh, theories have proven in the past that if you tax more Kenyans uh, or you tax, you know, you bring more taxes, the revenue does not, you know, gradually go up. Why? Because uh, people tend to sort of uh, evade pay taxes and therefore we need to balance the two. Government data shows that Kenya is spending about half of its revenue to pay back debts on its books to the International Development Association, the African Development Bank, the International Monetary Fund, China and Japan. Kennedy Wandera, VOA, Nairobi, Kenya. Meet a blind Tunisian man that's rewiring public prejudice as an electronics expert. He finds it difficult to convince his customers of a perfect job on their devices that need repair. Zoe Al Riahi is a blind electric repairman from Bu Arada in the Siliana Governorate. He gained popularity among Tunisian locals after stories published on social media. It was posted online showing his work repairing electrical appliances, including computers and audio speakers. The craftsman masterly handles electronic appliances in his workshop by relying on his sense of touch. 
recognizing every piece with his hands. The craftsman speaks about the main challenges he encounters in his career, which have more to do with psychology than his repair skills. The difficulties I face are to convince people and customers. Some customers bring me malfunctioning electric devices to repair them. But when they discover that I am blind, they change the shop in the belief that my capabilities are limited and I'm unable to repair them. Zuey al rihai himself admits that not all customers are happy to be helped by a blind worker. The customers have reduced my value and professional experience, and this is what affected my psyche and increased my determination to continue working and developing in this field. Some encourage me to continue and respect the opinions of all customers, and I will not be defeated by their negative reading towards me. I address my voice to the people with disabilities in the world. There are difficulties. There are also solutions. The difficulties are that I am blind, and solutions are possible in repairing and knowing the components of electric devices. I can also make new devices, helping me to gain confidence and challenge difficulties. Zuhair al rihai reportedly fell in love with radio devices after he turned blind and started growing fond of radio programs and music. Now his story of overcoming the odds has moved internet users. A 22-year-old Zimbabwean with cerebral palsy is hoping to compete in the 2024 Special Olympics Canada Winter Games in Calgary from February 27 to March 2nd. Meanwhile, groups that advocate for disabled people's rights are hoping to turn government policy into law. Columbus Mavunga reports from Harare in Zimbabwe. In Ufakos Township in Harare, Zimbabwe, Tapiwa Nashe, Prince Mutsikira spends his time running and training students at his former school, some of whom have disabilities. Mutsikira, a 22-year-old runner with cerebral palsy, hopes his hard work will help him qualify to represent Zimbabwe in track competitions at the 2024 Special Olympics Canada Winter Games in Calgary from February 27 to March 2. If I get the opportunity to go compete at the Olympics, it will really be exciting. I tell my colleagues that they can do the same, that with their disabilities, they can also compete. Do not look down on yourselves. He maintains a positive outlook despite having cerebral palsy, a group of disorders that affect a person's ability to move and maintain balance and posture. His grandmother, Tambuzai, who began caring for Mutsikiram when he was three says at one point she could not imagine her grandson training and competing like this. We thank God for Tapiwa's positive attitude. He is just 22 years old and trains other children living with disabilities. It's unbelievable. Zimbabwe statistics say that of its population of 16 million people, more than 1.4 million have a disability. Now organizations of people with disabilities in Zimbabwe are pushing for the passage of legislation that would make law some recommendations based on the government's disability policy launched in 2021. Advocates say the current law, the Disabled Persons Act of 1992, is falling short. If the bill is passed into law, it means so many other services that they are not accessing at the moment will be accessible. Because at the moment, our current act at the moment is outdated. Zimbabwe's policy says disabled people should have equal rights to employment, education and health, among other things. Government officials say some provisions of the national disability policy are being implemented. The government of Zimbabwe has now set up a national technical committee on disability inclusion. This committee has representatives from all the 26 government ministries. It has representatives from organizations of persons with disabilities and our development partners as well. Meanwhile, Mutsigira says he will keep pushing ahead and encouraging other persons with disabilities 
to do the same. Kolamba yeah, Zbafungam, VOA News, Harare, Zimbabwe. Well, and that's our show for today. You can find all the continent's top news and world news online at voaafrica.com. Check it out. I'm Vincent McCord in Washington. Channels Television has our last word. We look forward to bringing you another show next week. Do remember that channelstv.com is your source for news and other programming. I'm Jocker Rogers. Thanks for watching and goodbye.